had a, a message planned for the day and the Holy Spirit kind of shook me up yesterday and said, do something else. So I just have to obey him. And uh, the message uh, I want to bring this morning by the grace of God is on the Abba Father prayer, or known as the Lord's Prayer. Um, and, and it's a pattern of prayer. It's not a law. It's not something that you have to say by rope, like a machine, our Father who art in heaven, our Lord is in heaven. It's a principle of prayer. Well, let's go to it. Is the volume okay on this mic, by the way? Not too loud, not too loud. Okay. Let's go to Matthew 6, and we'll go from verse 6. Why is prayer, well, why are we teaching our prayer? Because... God is transitioning us into being a house of prayer, a church that is built on prayer, 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 nothing but prayer. And also without any fear and without any um, create fear, we need to be prepared for what's to come in the future. The world we are living in is changing, isn't it? Um, just from a I don't want to be boring, but from a, a geopolitical, listen, from a geopolitical point of view, this world is totally changing. Who remembers the last century, the last millennium? Who remembers the 1980s, the 1990s? That sort of time. Uh, who was, you know, who's been born in the 70s? The, those who grew up in those years. And we grew up in an era, for instance, where there was basically two powers in the world opposing each other. And yes, there was wars in the world, but there was two powers opposed to each other, the East and the West, um, the US and Russia. And that was bad, but it kept, in one sense, it kept the peace. Those two powers could never fully go to war. Um, but we're living in a world now, the US is diminishing, NATO is diminishing, China is rising. We're, we're, living, look, we're living in a world where, and Jesus said in the end times, there'd be rumors of wars that were rumor that threat. The threats of war are going to increase in the end times. The, the, the prophets in the Bible spoke about the events that have happened, graphically happened in the Middle East. They wrote, they wrote those things three and a half, four thousand years ago, that Israel... Uh, would be removed from its land, the Jewish people would be scattered among the nations, then, towards the time of the end, they would be regathered back to their land. It happened in 1948. And it all happened. Jerusalem uh, came back in their possession in 1967. And, and this is the time clock. It's the time clock for the, for the nations. And so we're living in, in biblical times, and the the biblical prophets also prophesied that there's a coming war and named the nations, Ezekiel named the nations by their former names. Uh, and there's an alliance that's going to attack Israel. There's Russia, Iran, Syria, Turkey, Sudan, uh, and other Islamic nations, but Russia is named. Uh, and, and so, and, and the region that's now Turkey is named. Twenty years ago, Turkey was a secular uh, member. You know, Kabul. It's, it's it's sliding towards becoming an Islamo-fascist dictatorship. And and so, this is the the world that's shaping up in this new millennium. And the Lord is coming soon. And we're not. This is not fear mongering. What Jesus said in the end time, there'll be plagues. And we can see, and we can think, oh, the signs of the end, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and uh, just the, the mobile phones that we have, you know, and the, the way techno technology uh, is, is, is in the end times. My wife mentioned the mark of the beast. Now, the mark of the beast comes after the church is removed from the earth, but the technology is here. And I believe I am right, and I have looked into this, that Hebrew numerology, that the letters in the Hebrew alphabet respond, that correspond to numbers, and the Hebrew equivalent of the letter W 
corresponds to the number six. So what is six six six? It is www. Um, that there will be a, a, a next leap forward in technology. Some are calling it the fourth revolution. We've had the industrial revolution. This is the next revolution to come. Artificial intelligence and all that. We're not going to speculate or fear monger, but we're living in this world that is changing, and I believe the Lord is coming soon. The Lord is coming soon, and He says, We are to watch and pray that we may escape these things that are coming upon the earth. But even in the run up to His coming, there's still going to be storms, there's still going to be great challenges and upheavals. Goodness knows what 2022 is bringing. I mean, we know there's more shakings to come. Uh, and before 2020, there was mature prophetic voices in the church. Our apostle was one of them. I've played the video, you've seen it. In, in the end of 2019, but four or five years running up to that, for years, he was saying that, but we sat there and he said, in the next decade, 2020, the great shakings begin. It is the beginning of the shakings, and it came, and it's, there's more shakings to come. Uh, we played a prophecy on Friday night from a lady called Prophet Kathy Lecture, who's now with the Lord in heaven. Uh, and, and, and this was back in 2013, and she prophesied, look, the, the, we don't have much day left. It's soon going to be night. We, we can't wait till Monday before we start. Like, we've got to start now. We've got to pray now. We've got to seek God now. We've got to pray and seek God because we have unsaved loved ones. There's an urgency. It's not a fear mongering. It's not a, a wrong intensity. But there is an urgency to wake up. And so we are, you know, God has called us to be a house of prayer. So let's go to the scriptures. Okay, Matthew 6 verse 6. Okay. When you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. Say the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. Okay, so... We need the secret place. The secret place. And that's referenced in Psalm 91. It talks about those who dwell in the secret place of the Most High. Those who dwell in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty, against whose power no foe can withstand. There's a secret place. It's the presence of God. Why is it called a secret place? Now, God hides things, listen to this, make a note of it or just remember it. God hides things for you, but not from you. Mm -hmm. If you're God's child, he hides things for you, but not from you. There's a secret place because it's not entirely obvious. If it wasn't secret, anybody could just see it and just... You know, just roll on in. We can't just do that. It, it, has, it has to be revealed to us. It comes by revelation. And that comes by a relationship with the Father. So there's a secret place. He wants us to come into the secret place. And it's a place of safety, protection, and provision. And above all, it's a place of intimacy. It's a place where we are in relationship with Him. And one of the key things that we've been taught in, in, in prayer, in the presence of God, and, and we're all, we are always learning, when you approach the presence of God, leave your own personal needs at the door to begin with. Never, ever, and please hear me, I don't want to hear like heavy, like I'm setting the law down, but... But don't come into the presence of God with your own needs first. God knows you've got needs. Okay? If we come in a, in a mindset of crisis, we'll stay in crisis. 
we come into the presence of God to minister to him. Okay? To minister to him. And we could say, well, he doesn't need it. No, he doesn't. But somebody needs to be the center of the universe. And that somebody does not need to be my ego. Okay? Or your ego. Somebody needs to be the center of it all. And it, he is God. So he alone takes that place. And he says, I will reward you. I will reward you. I will reward you openly. That means your life is going to look different. That means... In, in the sight of unbelievers and relatives and friends, your life is going to start looking good. Amen? Does that look good? Is that good? Yeah. God's going to tell you, we, we have this thing, and I, look, obviously, we're under grace. Amen? We're under grace. Now, there's biblical grace, and then there's the unbiblical grace. And because of maybe, oh, I, I don't want to like work for it and I don't want to earn it I'm sorry the Bible says you reward you openly if you seek him the Bible says if you diligently seek him he will demote you is that what it says he says he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him what does the word diligent mean it means prioritize prioritize it also means God I said it actually means effort it's not a dead work. Works are wrong if they're dead. This is a work of faith. So God's a rewarder. That means he, he, that means you're the one who's not going to be losing your job. You're not only not going to be losing your job, you're going to be getting a better one with a better package. Because God is going to reward you openly. When you refuse to compromise and live for him in the right way, God is going to reward you openly. Hallelujah. That means if it's open, that means everybody can see it. That means your mom, your dad, your brothers and sisters, unsaved loved ones, friends, colleagues are going to see there's something about you because you are being rewarded openly. And he says, look, when you pray, don't... There's something we've got to recapture. When we come before the Father, forget formula. Vain repetition. There's a place to confess the word. So, you know, we can come into the presence of God and straight away, we've got our, con some, got our confession sheet out. And we're just confession, confessing, confessing. Now, if we take, I don't know, if we take God's word and use it to praise him, Lord, you are great, hallelujah. You are my rock. You are, thank you. You are my redeemer. You are my provider. Hallelujah. I'll just praise God on my own then. Hallelujah. You are my provider. You are my deliverer. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I fear not, for you are with me. Hallelujah. I'm not dismayed, for you are my God. You will help me. You will strengthen me. You will uphold me with your righteous right hand. Thank you, Jesus. You know the thoughts and the plans that you have for me, Father. Plans not to harm me, but to prosper me, to give me a hope and a certain future. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Feel the opening. Because it's God's word, praise the Him. But I'm not taking God's word and using it like a chukum. Like a bending machine. Okay. God knows my needs. I'm using his word and I'm getting my heart and saying, Thank you, you're a good father. I'm praising him with his own word and I'm praising him with what's in my heart. Hallelujah. Glory to God. By the way, it's not possible, just watch my body language for a second. We can't praise God like this. Arms for the turkey face. Okay. <laughs> when England played Italy in the European Cup final, and those of believers were distracted. Hallelujah. Uh, anyway, moving on. Um, had England won, everyone's gone, oh, I want to win. I remember the Euro 96. Euro 96, I've been saved two months, I was watching it in a bar in Newcastle. I still had some sanctification to go. And they were playing Germany, okay, which is a touchy one. But we love Germans, we love you. But football, yeah, we still love them. 
and England's playing Germany. And I'm like, everybody, the whole atmosphere in the bars, come on, come on. And I confess, I remember, I, I went to the toilet, and I went in the cubicle, I went, please, no, we haven't won anything. We haven't won anything for years. We haven't won anything for years. And we lost. Because that was using pain rubber. <laughs> that wasn't in pain. Hallelujah. Praise him. So we enter his presence. Now what I'm saying is, we can't praise God like this. Arms are tightly cold in the of this. Because had England won that match, had England won that night, do you think everybody would have been like this? They would have been oh, crazy. Yes! Because when you praise your body and your body language and how you use your body follows your spirit. If anybody looks at their favorite team and their favorite team wins, they don't say that their, their body just, oh, hallelujah, kush, <laughs> hallelujah, glory. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So we don't need vain repetitions and formula. We don't need to copy the spirituality of the world. Okay, we don't need to copy spirituality from other religions. We are coming before a father who knows what we need before we even ask him. Who here as a parent, you have a sense of you love your child and you have, uh, uh, and if you're in touch with what God is saying about your child, and you've got a relationship with your child because you're older than, and wiser, you have a sense of um, what they need in their next stage of growth as a person. The, the, the areas where, where you, what they need, that they're, they're this age, and you, you have a vision. This is the next thing, and, and you and you're grateful. And this is the next thing, because you're a parent, and you have that care, and you're older, and you're wiser. That's how God is with us. God knows, and ultimately these things are for our happiness as well. This is for our good. And it's for our happiness. And we are really are coming to a father who has our well-being at heart. I mean, just say that word, father. 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 Yeah. Father. 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 I mean, if you're, if you're a father here today, if you're a parent, if you're a mother or a father, if you are in the middle of something, and your child, you hear the word, mom, dad, even if it's irritating, even if it's completely at the wrong time, does everything in you, does it get your attention? If you're a parent, can you say that? If you hear the word dad or mom, something in you pricks up goes, what? <laughs> Even if it is. Have you ever seen this in church? I've seen parents worship in church. Oh, you have us, yeah, I love you, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Been in church before. Hallelujah. Our two sons, Ben and John Mark, stop them and bang, 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 bang. <laughs> uh, Something in you when you hear mother, when you hear father, instantly. Because they, they have. It's not that they own you. Your kids don't own you, but there's something in you they have a right to. Do you know what I mean? As soon as they say mum or dad, even if they're naughty, even if they're at that time being irritating kids, even in other times when it's beautiful, as soon as you have mum, dad, everything in you is like, wow. How much more God? How much more your heavenly father? I mean, literally, that uh, just, father! Amen. Abba, Father, come on, hallelujah. Oh, I'm just praising myself now. Abba, Father, hallelujah. Father, 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 shout Father. Father, Father, Father. Hallelujah. So we're praying to the Father. We're praying to the Father. We're asking the Father. Who he is, a parent, you have a child come and ask you things. They ask you. And they go, Dad, I want. Uh, when they become a teenager, I hear the word dad, and I'm like, yeah, 
Or next. For they have the, they have that access. Say access. When you have when you have a right to use the name Father, you it automatically gives you access. Wow. The word father. There's two words for father. There's the word Abba and the word Peter. Peter is the word father here. And it means this. It means progenitor, originator, a creator of a nation, a tribe, or a people, a patriarch. Okay? It's where you get your identity from. Everybody today, loads of people struggle with a sense of identity. They don't know who they are. They don't know where they come from, they don't know where, who they are, and they don't know what their purpose is, and they don't know where they're going. When you get to know God as your Father, that's where you come from. You come from Him. That's where you're going. You're going to Him. Your purpose, you're His child. Uh, and, and you get identity. You get a sense of your insecurity, and, and all, your, all the, the weakness and feebleness in your character, well, He just goes to work on it. Uh, and he makes you a son or a daughter. Hallelujah. That's our Father in heaven. That word Peter, the word Abba, is the very much the very affectionate, uh, uh, you know, very soft and affectionate aspect of God the Father. The word Peter, that's the character form of part of God. You know, which one gives you the most security? Peter. That's where you get your insecurity dealt with. That's where the, the rebellion and us, the insecurity, the the, the, all the inadequacy, all this lack of identity people have, it all gets driven out by the love of Father, who shapes your character, who gives you identity. So you don't need a technique. You don't need vain repetition when you're praying to this God. He's amazing. So, Jesus said, because they asked him, how do we pray? So he's telling them how not to pray. He said, don't do that. He says, you must have a secret place. Then he says, verse 9, Matthew 6, In this manner, therefore pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom the power and the glory forever. Amen. So it starts with our Father. Our Father. Now we could, it, it, you could just as much say, my Father. So, in a sense, two different types of prayer. It's individual prayer. Where you pray, it's just you. And then there's the corporate prayer, group prayer. So, when you next have your own time with God, call him my father. Come before him, my father. Just say that now. My father. If you just think and encompass it, what is all that encapsulate? My father, where my identity comes from. Where my personal sense of security comes from. Where my feeling adequate comes from. Where my sense of purpose, where I come from, who I am, where I'm going, comes from. But if Jesus says, our Father. And so we, we need our prayer life on our own. But as I touched on last week, a lot of the New Testament prayer, a lot of the prayer in the New Testament is group prayer. It's corporate prayer. Why? Because there's power in it. Because one can put a thousand to fight, but two can put... 10,000. There's a thousand percent increase. Wow. There is one thousand percent increase of prayer power. That's the difference between from one thousand to ten thousand. That is a one thousand percent increase. So when we pray on our own, there's, there's, a, there's a flow of the Spirit, there's a grace. Praise God. When we pray corporately as the church, the walls, the things begin to shed. When the church prays in unity, when the church comes before our Father, say our Father. So if it's our Father, guess what that makes us? Brothers and sisters. Hallelujah. He's our Father 
And that creates a unity and a cohesion and a synergy in the spirit. And goodness me, if anybody's bound up in a dungeon or in a prison, you better watch out because things are going to shake. That's what happens when the church prays. There is a 1,000% increase in prayer power. And we've been given this. I can say, we can say our Father, my Father. You know, who, who bought us the right? To call him Father. It's Jesus. On the cross. Listen, Jesus all throughout his life. Always called God Father. There's one place. Where Jesus. Did, did not call God Father. And that was at the cross. In Matthew 27. 46, he said. My God. My God. Why have you forsaken me? Why have you rejected me? He didn't say, my father, my father. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So that we who repent and put our trust and accept Jesus, we will never, ever, we will never need to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Forever, we will be worshipping him. 10,000 years, hallelujah. Like the song says, my father, my father, thank you that you have accepted me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I love it. I think it's in the book of Galatians. It says, The Spirit within us, the Spirit with us, within us cries, Abba Father. Abba Father. I used to think Abba was a dodgy 70s pop group. If anyone's got a DVD called Mamma Mia, please bring it back. Yeah. Yeah. As well as just dodgy. Uh, but that music as well, honestly, just got saying it. Yeah, what a, Abba Father. Abba Father. The spirit within us cries, Abba, Father. In the Greek, it's Abba, 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 Abba. The spirit in us cries, Father, Father. And this is awesome. Who remembers the story in the Old Testament when the mantle dropped off Elijah and fell on Elisha? And what did Elisha cry? He cried, My Father, My Father. It's a wordplay in Galatians because the spirit within us is crying, my father, my father. And when the spirit in us is not no more saying, who am I? I'm a reject. I'm a nobody. I, I don't belong anywhere. I've got no beginning. I've got no sense of origin. I've got no sense of purpose. And I don't know where I'm going. But now you're delivered and the spirit in you is going, my father, my father. My father, my father, and it's like you go from one dimension to another in the spirit, and the spirit of God, the mantle of Jesus Christ, the Son, has fallen upon you every single day. Hallelujah. Praise the living God. Oh, you want to be filled with the spirit, just start shouting, My father, my father, my father, my father, because he's the, the spirit of God, the spirit of sonship, he's the spirit of adoption. It puts a sense of your mind. Spirit of fatherhood on the inside of you. Praise the Lord. So, okay. The Lord's Prayer, the Abba Father Prayer, is not a, it's not a prayer that you have to pray by rote. Nothing wrong with praying it like that, but it's a set of principles. Number one principle when we come to pray, I touched on this already. The first thing Jesus said, this is how you pray. Our Father, who is in heaven. We recognize our Father. The next thing is, hallowed be your name. So principle number one is, we minister to Him. We minister to Him because He's God. Even in the good and the bad. Even in the worst day. Even in a day of loss and grief and sorrow. We still have an offering within ourselves to give to Him. Within you is an offering. Within you, every day, within you is an offering that belongs to Him. Don't end your day still keeping it. Give it to Him. Give it to Him as first priority in your day. I've got a busy day. I know we've got busy days. Give that offering on the inside to him. Minister to him. 
we are learning as a people, as by the grace of God, we've increased prayer to minister to the Lord. Say, minister to the Lord. So the presence of God, we minister to Him. We serve Him with offerings of praise and worship. And yes, our finances as well. God doesn't need it. For God doesn't need anything. For He's God. Then it's either my ego be the center or he. He doesn't have ego. He be the center of everything. In worship, one of the, the most beautiful things about worship is when we worship, our ego, our self is displaced. The one thing about our life that makes us more miserable than anything is ego is self. In the presence of God, ego is displaced. Even in our hardest trial when we're suffering and we're going through things that are not fair, to minister to the Lord and allow self and ego to be displaced. Just to put Him first. You are good. You are good. And I worship you. I don't even understand, God, what's going on, but I worship you. And, and He says, Our Father, and for the church, Number one priority, Jesus said, be a house of prayer. The fire shall always be burning on the altar. It shall never go out. That's priority for the church. As a church, thank God, as a church, we have some form of prayer every single day. Praise God. To keep the fire on the altar because priority number one before anybody's needs is <laughs> to minister and worship Him, to keep Him the center, to make Him the center, then everything else falls into place. Which is what, why the next part of the Lord's Prayer, Jesus said, "Now pray, let Your kingdom come, let Your will be done." And even in this, we can be, "Oh, my needs, my needs. I've got this anxiety. I have that anxiety. I have this fear." Well, if I want the kingdom of God to come, what is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is the government of heaven. Okay, we have a government in Westminster. We have a local government in Leeds at the town hall. So we are in this city subject to the government of Leeds City Council. In this nation, we are subject to the government in Westminster. In London. Who wants to live more and more subject to the government of our Lord Jesus Christ? Yes. Hallelujah. Isn't that a good government to be under? Yes. I mean, thank God we pray for those in authority. Because there's something about His government. It says in Isaiah 9, 7, Of the increase of His government and peace, there shall be no end. That word peace is the word shalom. Say shalom. shalom. The word shalom means this. Nothing missing. Nothing lacking, nothing broken. Hallelujah. Who wants your life to look like this? Your family, your kids, your marriage, your job, your finances, your future. Nothing missing, nothing lacking, nothing broken. And that's us so good. And, and, and he says here, yeah, this is the nature of his government. What's the nature of our government? I don't know. I, I mean, our government is whatever. But then his government's a perfect government. And by nature... Wherever his government is established, there's going to be nothing missing, nothing lacking, nothing broken. And it says its increase knows no end. That means it's an expanding government. It expands, it expands, it expands. So every area of your life, if this government is pushing into your family, your life, nothing missing, nothing lacking, nothing broken. We're taking this government into the city, in the hills, in the name of Jesus, so people with broken lives who are addicted and diseased and demonized stuff. In the name of Jesus, there's going to be nothing missing, nothing lacking, nothing broken. Restoration in Jesus' name. And we want that government to be established in this church. So glorify a church. Nothing missing, nothing lacking, nothing broken. There's peace. There's shalom whilst the world's going to pop. Why? Because this government is established. How does this government get established? This government, this throne, 
God's government comes when his throne is established. How does his throne get established? Upon the praises of his people. That is not an event. We tend to think praise when we have 20 minutes of music in church. 10 minutes of quick songs. And then we have a quick ballad. You know? An emotional song. I'm not against that. We've had some beautiful songs this morning. Praise is a lifestyle. It's keeping the fire on the altar as a church. Being a house of prayer. A house of offerings. Being a house that offers prayer, praise, worship and offerings to God. Ensures that his throne is established amongst us. His government is established. That's why some of us are testifying that your life feels different. Why? Because the government of God is getting established in your life. The presence of God is upon your life. Hallelujah. So let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. When that government is established, then we are praying. We are starting to pray. Thank you, Father. I just pray and declare. And I thank you for your government being established in my child's life at school this week. In the lives of the children at school this week. In Jesus' name. We are thanking you, Father, and we are praying. Come on, we pray, Father, for every child in this church. And we pray that they are going to be the head and not the tail. We pray that the grace of God upon them, the blood of Jesus upon them, that there is nothing missing, lacking, or broken about their lives in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We pray for your kingdom to come, your will to be done in the lives of our unsaved loved ones and friends in our jobs this week. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Glory to God. See, we're, we're praying from a place of faith. We're not praying from a place of crisis. Oh, Lord, please help. Hallelujah. Now, this next part, daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. I remember... At the age of five or six, in school, we taught the Lord's Prayer. And I didn't go to a church school. But from a, from a young age, I always thought daily bread means just enough. It's living, basically living on the bread line. Living in daily bread is just getting by. Well, that contradicts what we've just heard before. If his kingdom comes and his will is done, if his government comes... And there's nothing missing, lacking, broken about our life. Well, then let's pray that we live on the bread line. What's going on? Does God want you to just have enough? Just to be average and mediocre? Because He wants to reward you openly. So, what is daily bread? Daily bread is accessing a dimension in the spirit. A supernatural supply. That's daily bread. And you see it, a huge example of that in the Old Testament is mentioned here. It's mentioned in Exodus, but I love how it's mentioned in Psalm 78, verse 23 25. Psalm 78, 23 25. It says, He commanded the clouds above and opened the doors of heaven. How do you say? Open the doors of heaven. Father, let your kingdom come, let your will be done. Open the doors of heaven. Open the windows of heaven. Amen. Book of Malachi says he opens windows of heaven and pours out such a blessing. He opens the doors of heaven. He rains down manna on them to eat and gives them bread of heaven. Men ate angels' food. That was an angel of the light. They ate angels' food. So daily bread in the wilderness, two million people. Two million people left Egypt. They'd been slaves. They'd been malnourished. They'd been mistreated. There was not one feeble among them. Not one sick or feeble among them. Two million people walking in supernatural divine health. You think, how is that possible? I just, in my own life, I mean, some of us here, you've been healed. I used to have Crohn's disease. I used to have rheumatism. I'm not feeble. I'm not weak anymore. Glory to God. Amen. What God does for one, he can do for anybody. So there's two million people, not one feeble amongst them. And they come out and then and he says, they came out loaded with silver and gold. So the, the kingdom was manifested in their lives. And then he decides, I'm going to feed you every single day with bread of heaven, with angels. I'm going to give you substance that comes from the supernatural realm. 
but it's there by, by faith. Listen, the supernatural operates like this. We heard about some miracles and healings earlier on. Miracles happen now. God is I am, not I was, not I will be. We live in time. He is outside of time. It's when eternity connects with our time. It's now. And it's, we can't, when God manifests his power, his presence and his glory, we can't bottle it, we can't market it, we can't package it, people try, but we can't. It's now. We have to have it in the now. Then we have to believe tomorrow to have it then. Then the next day we have to believe to have it then. It's daily bread. Jesus demonstrated it when he fed 5,000, probably more like 20,000 people, including women and children. He demonstrated the bread from heaven. Jesus accessed a realm of supernatural supply. In the coming days ahead, God is saying, I'm opening windows of heaven over you, glorified church. I'm opening doors of heaven. And I'm calling you up to access realms of supernatural supply. I tell you, I prophesy 12 months from now, we will not be here. Amen. We will be in a place where you will say, wow, look what the Lord has done. Yes. And it came from an open door. Hallelujah. It came from an open door. From a season of pandemic. <laughs> from a season of shakings. From a season in the middle of a wilderness when the economy doesn't look good. I tell you, you've got an open heaven over your life. You're not going to lack for fuel in your car. Amen. Amen. You're not going to lack for food in your home. You're going to have a good Christmas this Christmas. A great big fat turkey on your table. Unless you have a chicken and rice lamb. <laughs> You're not going to lack for anything. Look, this isn't the green. This is you got. We're God's kids. Yeah. We're the Father's kids, yeah. and He wants to reward us openly. So people look at our life and go, "I want what you've got." So daily bread is the dimension of supernatural supply. It's daily because the supernatural is now. And I love this revelation in Matthew 16. I've got to speed up, speed up. Matthew 16, verse 8. It says, "Jesus says, Oh, you of little faith." Why do you reason among yourselves? Because you've got no bread. What's the story? That the disciples are in a boat with Jesus. They're feeling hungry. Peter goes to John. He says, hey, uh, did, you, did you get some sandwiches before we came out? He says, oh, I forgot. I've just got this, uh, I've just got a bit of pizza from last night. That's it. Says, what? We're going to do this 12 of us here. Plus Jesus. They start to reason. We're hungry. Where are we going to get this from? Where are we going to get that from? How are we going to pay this? How are we going to pay that? How are we going to pay this? How are we going to pay that? And Jesus turns around and says, Guys, stop it. Say, stop it. Stop it. He says, Do you not. This is saying a Yorkshire accent, verse 9. He says, Do you not yet understand? He says, Why do you reason? Say, Stop reasoning. Stop reasoning. Reasoning is in the mind. Now, God has given us a mind, a logical mind. And if you're left brain, that's okay. If you're an engineer, an IT type person, a mathematician, don't be in conflict with yourself. Great. Just get blasted and filled with the Holy Spirit as well. You need a logical mind. Please don't try and cross the road without a logical mind. Okay? You will see Jesus. Too soon. So don't. You need a logical mind. But when it comes to the things of God, your logical mind gets in the way. And if you need miracles from God, and you just get in the presence of God, come here every night for prayer, I'm telling you, you don't have to reason how your miracle will come. It will just come. Hallelujah. Because you're in the presence of God. God will speak to your heart and bring it through you. So he says, stop reasoning. Verse 9. Do you not understand? Do you not remember? The five loaves of the 5,000, how many baskets it took up. So he said, look guys, if you want to enter this dimension of supernatural supply, you've got to deal with reason. Stop reasoning. Get your education, study, get your exams, go to university, do, do all this stuff. 
But don't, when it comes to the supernatural, get rid of your reason. When it comes to the supernatural and believe in God, stop reasoning. Hallelujah. Stop reasoning. Get in the presence. Hallelujah. Get in the fire. Get in the presence. Let Him speak to your heart. Let Him build faith in your heart. Glory to God. The next part of the praise is, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. But in this King James translation, it says, forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. Why? Sin produces a deficit in our conscience. Just like there's economic anxiety at the moment. There's economic anxiety, isn't it, for the economy? That there's going to be a deficit. There's going to be problems. Sin produces a debt. It produces a deficit in our conscience. Which produces a weight. And drags us down. And even more than that. When we don't forgive other people. We have to forgive our debtors. If we are holding people in debt. That's like a 10 ton weight on our own conscience. Now look, listen, if somebody's abused you, used you, hurt you, you can't forgive them, but it doesn't mean you put yourself in a position to be abused again. You, you, you can't live, like Jesus said, as wise as a snake and as innocent as a dove. Being a Christian does not mean being a monk and being taken for a right. Read the book of Proverbs every day. Get some wisdom in you. And nobody will take you far right again. But you'll never be bitter with people. When people hurt and, and use you. Let it go. Because it produces a weight. On your conscience. That drags you down. And it stops the power. And the flow of God in your life. And somebody's got to break the cycle of vengeance. The church has to break the cycle of vengeance so that we can begin to make it a session for others. So that we can begin to make it a session for others rather than calling out for vengeance upon them. Start making it a session for them. That's an intercessor. That's what's going to bring revival. The next part of the prayer is this. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one. The Bible says in James 1 verse 13, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Temptation does not come from God. But in these end times that we are living in, we need to pray that we don't fall asleep. We need to pray that we are not given over. To a reprobate mind. This is quite serious stuff. Many people in today's world. In, in Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Jesus speaks about the end times. He uses the word deceive or deception more than any other word. One of the main features of the end times is deception. People in the church are being deceived. And I mean the church. And so one of our prayers is Lord I don't want to fall asleep. I don't want to be part of the great falling away. Again, I'm not, I'm not fear mongering, but the scripture speaks that it's coming in the end, a great falling away. Is that what the Bible teaches? Yeah. So I'm saying, Lord, I don't want to fall asleep. Uh, Jesus taught about the wise and the foolish virgins. Those who fall asleep, those who are awake, those who are oil in their lamp. Lord, I don't, Lord, don't, don't let me go that way. Why do I have to, why am I crying out to God and praying that for myself? Because I'm aware of my own propensity to weakness. I'm aware of my own propensity to distraction and passivity. I'm aware all of us have a propensity to be offended. One thing Jesus said about the end times, he says, many will be offended. Many people will be offended. Can you see all the offense in the world? Cancel culture. It's all offense. It's everywhere. Offense. And so Lord, let not my heart be an offended heart that gets resentment, bitterness, offense in it. Let me not be passive and fall asleep. And let me be diligent because I'm aware of my own weaknesses and propensity otherwise, Father. And you know it says, deliver us from the evil one. 
Jesus said, look, this is how you pray. Pray to the Father. Father, deliver me from the evil one. He doesn't say, okay, guys, this is how you pray. Jesus speaking, right. I want you to go to the high places in your city, map out your whole city, and you rebuke the devil, and you rebuke the principalities and powers, and you do all that. Does he? He says, you cry out to the Father, Father, deliver me from sin. Deliver me from the evil one. Now look, there is a place for spiritual warfare. And there is a fivefold ministry as well. That's serious stuff. I could touch on that again. I, I, uh, I have a friend, well, I, 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 a mentor, someone who's very big part of my life, who's an apostle uh, in the northeast of England. People came to him and they said, hey, hey, we're going to go pray on the Roman wall. We're going to bind the spirit of Zeus. Come with us. He went, I'll, I'll go and ask the Lord. And the Lord said, don't tell them nothing. Oh, are you afraid of the spirit of Zeus? No. But God hasn't said do it. And they did it. And the guy that organized it was dead a week later. Serious. We're not afraid of these things. We're not we are not to be afraid of the enemy. But we have to be wise. We have to be wise. And primarily our spirituality must not be a devil conscious spirituality. Do I believe in casting out demons? Absolutely. In Jesus' name, I cast out demons. In Jesus' name, I, the Bible says, resist the devil. Yes, amen. But I'm not devil conscious. I'm Jesus conscious. I'm Father conscious. Hallelujah. And if I'm saying, Lord, deliver me from evil, well, maybe he has to show me, well, son, you've, you've, in this area of your life, you've opened this door, you you need to forgive here. You need to put this right. Thank you, Lord. I have, and this is testament. My, my friend from the northeast, who was an apostle, he was sick nearly to put to death. He went through three years of serious sickness and disease. Nearly died on a number of occasions. He's preached in about 30, 40 countries all over the world. He's seen millions of people saved. He's got a massive testimony. He's seen every miracle in the Bible. So many blind eyes see this massive, massive miracle testimony salvations. And he was sick nearly unto death. And uh, and I was talking to him a little while back and he said he went before God. I said, God, what is it? And he said, He said, God showed me all the people that had hurt me in ministry. And I had to forgive them all. He says, as soon as I forgive them all, power of God came on me in my life. He says, I've been well since. And this was a man who was in and out of hospital. His, his legs had swollen up. He had liver kidney problems. He was in a really bad state. Touching God. And he says, when God showed me what the issue was, because he had warfare, he, had, he was under attack. But when he got before the Father, Lord, deliver me from evil. We need to pray in this day and age. Deliver me. Father, not be devil conscious, not be fear mongering, not be afraid of the enemy. But let's fear God. Father, show me. I want to be delivered from evil, Father. And the Lord's prayer finishes for yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. It begins with reverence for the Father and it ends with reverence for the Father. You know, it's good to pray like this. Not a law, you must, you must, but this principle and the Abba Father prayer. If we pray like this every day, oh, it's going to be good. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. So, Father, we thank you that we have a secret place. We don't have to reason we just have to be in your presence. We thank you, Father, that you are a good Father. Father, we want to be conscious of you. We don't want to be devil conscious, but we don't want to be ignorant of the enemy's devices. But we want to fear you, not fear anything else. Father, we thank you. We call you Father. Amen. We call you Father. We call you Father. We call your father. We call your father. Just begin to call him father. Mm -hmm. 
Father, 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 Hallelujah, Father, 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 for those insecure and fearful, call them Father, 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 God, we thank you that we dwell in the secret place of the Most High. Hallelujah. Psalm 91. I'm just going to declare this. This is powerful. Psalm 91 verses 9 to 12. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, the most high your dwelling place, there shall no evil befall you. Neither shall any plague or calamity come near you. For he will give his angels charge over you to accompany and defend and preserve you in all of your ways. They shall bear you up on their hands lest you dash your feet against the soul. Give him praise. He's a good God. He is a good God. I tell you, in the days ahead, in the months and in the years ahead, he is going to, I'm telling you, in the name of Jesus, he is going to reward you openly. Hallelujah. Who wants to be rewarded openly? Hallelujah. I want to be rewarded openly. Hallelujah. I want the reward of God upon my life. This is not to make us arrogant, but I tell you, other people are going to look and say, and then you can bring them to Jesus, bring them to salvation, and bring them into that same reward, that same covering, that same protection. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Who's been blessed this morning? Yeah. Hallelujah. Who's been fed? Yeah. You feel full on the inside. Hallelujah. God is good. Just if you've got a prayer request, just tell, oh, come on, just tell your father. Don't be religious. Right? Say Father, say Abba, Father, Daddy, Papa. Tell him, tell him now what you want. Come on, hallelujah. Hallelujah. This little one here, just that you say, Dad, I want, I want. <laughs> Your older sister there also says, I want. <laughs> hallelujah. Tell him what you want. Tell him. Ask him. Thank him. Come before him in the name of Jesus. If you're here and you need a new car, go on, ask him for a car. Ask him for a new car. Need a new house? Ask him for a new house. You can hear stuff like that and think, that'll never happen. We were driving a car once that was about 160,000 miles on the clock. It was virtually, it was held together by air, by faith. And I lay in bed one night. And I thought, this car is not good. I felt the Holy Spirit stir me and he said, well, ask me for a car. And I did. I woke up the next morning, there was a new car outside. <laughs> Keys to the letterbox. It doesn't matter that God spoke to someone to do that and bless that person. But God, that was from God. Hallelujah. <laughs> ask your Father in heaven. Who, who wants a new job? Who wants something to change in your job? Amen. Amen. Go on, stand your feet and say, Father, who wants a better, you know, you've got a job, but you think, I need, to, I need to develop myself. I need to develop more. Things need to change in my life. Ask your Father. If you're at home on live stream, get asking your Father.